Hello, hello. Welcome to episode one of Colin in Mono. My name is Colin Sparling, and I will be your host on this journey. This is episode one, the pilot, the flagship, small beginnings and all that stuff. Episode one, I'm super excited to start this podcast off with this particular episode because I sat down with Roger Cadill, who is a bouldering coach. He teaches kids how to climb rock walls without any sort of safety equipment, no harnesses, no lines or anything like that. Uh, And it was super cool to sit down with him and talk about that, what his day looks like, um, what it means to be a coach. And this quickly devolves into a conversation about kind of the morality of coaching and how a coach can really have a positive or negative effect on someone and how we've dealt with uh, good and bad coaches in the past ourselves. Uh, So it's a super great conversation. I'm super excited for you guys to hear it. And I also want to tell you about what will be the theme song for the foreseeable future for the show. Uh, It is a song, and you're you're going to hear it right after this, but uh, it is a song called Translation by a band called Life Before Us. Uh, They're good friends of mine. The song was written by Christian Crump. I'm going to put their information in the description box below uh, so you can go listen to their stuff if you like what you hear. Um... But it was super great to get with Christian and be like, hey, man, uh, if you have any songs or like if you can make a song for me, that would be great. Luckily, he was already sitting on one and I love it. It's right in my wheelhouse of music. So I will definitely admit to that. It's definitely in my wheelhouse. It's to my personal taste. But you know what? It's my show and that's how I wanted it to sound. So, uh, yeah. All right. I'm going to stop talking now and I'm going to send it over to my conversation with Roger Cadell all about bouldering. Let's start the show. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to Colin and Mono. I am your host, Colin Sparling. Today, I am joined by a very special guest. His name is Roger Caudill. Is that you say his name? Did you no. Say your name. <laughs> say, say your name for me. Roger Cadill. Cadill. Yeah. Cadill. Is that right? Yeah. Hard okay. K. Har- hard K. Okay. Uh-huh. Uh, and I brought him in because I'm I'm super interested in what you do. So we've had many in conversation, at least in passing, about your your profession your your profession rather in bouldering. But you're a bouldering coach, right? Yeah, I coach six teams now. Wow. Holy I, shit. Yeah, it doubled this season, which is more than doubled, actually, which is uh, pretty intimidating. It's now a full-time job, which I did not expect it to be when I started. So what th- what what is your title, actually, as a bouldering coach? Do you just call yourself a bouldering coach, or is there like a, like an actual title there? Yeah, I have a few titles. Uh The biggest one is I am the lead on-site coach. Our on-site team is our highest level of competition for our youth. So it's we have three youth teams, and the on-site one is the one you want to be on uh, because it's the one I coach. But it's also the one that requires the like strictest attendance as well as mandatory competition. Okay, so so take me take me through. uh, Gosh, I'm trying to think of where to start. So take me through what it's like to be a bouldering coach. Like what, what does your normal day look like? Well, um, right now I'm in preseason. So about twice or three times a week, I do some like mandatory study hall sessions. I might go to a physical therapist and work on our warmups and design exercises for the kids. Or I will actually try out the workouts or just do, uh, training programs. Like right, right now I'm in the middle of writing our, first non-linear periodization program which is a way to train that prevents your body from adapting to the particular workout patterns oh okay so it's like uh uh, what was that really uh heavy marketing phrasing used uh was it p90x that said like muscle confusion or something like that is it the same idea so I'm not really familiar with P90X, but it is muscle confusion. It is okay. like every week we're going to change the theme and every four weeks we're going to totally overhaul the system so that your body will never 
not be sore at the end of a workout. Whoa, that that's crazy. And so um, to, to explain a little bit uh, for the audience, so explain exactly what bouldering is. Oh, yeah. Bouldering is a bad idea. Uh, <laughs> see, because I mean, I see you coming in because we have class together, Roger and I. And I see Roger coming in with bandages on his fingers and, and his sore all over. So, yeah. T- <laughs> so what, what exactly are you doing, man? Bouldering. So bouldering is rock climbing and it is right. rock climbing without any gear except for your climbing shoes and maybe a chalk bag. Uh, you don't climb past a height where you would get injured falling, but that's not all the time true. Every fall in bouldering is a ground fall, which means you are hitting the ground. And you oh have to be very good at uh, transitioning your momentum and your force throughout your entire body as you fall. Oh, that just that makes me wince when I, <laughs> when I think about it. So, so what's what's the technique then for 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 doing the, this sort of climbing is it like because i've seen tv shows i've seen videos of the people that are like um they do freeform lot rock climbing but they, they they assess basically cracks in like walls of rock and stuff like that and that's where they like they slot their hands in or whatever or they find they're not, they're very strategic about where they have their foot placements and things like that am i on the right track yeah, so you're describing crack climbing, which oh, isn't okay. bouldering. Bouldering is the highest intensity and the lowest volume form of climbing. So okay. it's a sprint, and it's a sprint every time, which makes it very high impact. Uh, the technique is going to change climb to climb, depending on like what angle and what climbing style it requires. Sure. And it is definitely the most varied and skill-heavy style of climbing. Okay, okay. So... So t- take me through when when you yourself are about to do do the act of bouldering. <laughs> what 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 is that like? What so t- like from beginning to end? What's your routine? What how do you prep? And then into the actual climb itself. So do you want to know how I prep when I'm training? How I prep when I'm climbing outside? Or how I prep before a competition? So so take actually just take me take me yeah so so take me from preparation training into day of and then the actual climb itself. Okay, right now I am training for our opens bouldering season, which is going to be starting as early as September, and I'm pretty nervous for it because this is my first time back in opens, which is the highest level of uh, competition in oh, wow. three years. Okay. Uh, my training right now, I just switched from endurance training to power training. So before this week i was just doing what's called arcing i was staying on the wall climbing for 25 to 30 minutes resting that same amount of time hopping back on the wall for 25 to 30 minutes resting and then repeating it one more time with a reduced time and that destroys your hands (laughs) i can see that for the for the audience he's holding up his hands and his hands are just torn up yeah that uh, cause you're holding on what we call jugs, which are like giant holds. Think about like a milk jug and you hold it, uh, like you're gripping the entire thing, which wow. you get a lot of friction when you're holding onto jugs and moving on jugs, which causes this thing. We call them flappers where your skin tears off your hands. Oh my God. So, so to, to interrupt you real quick. So when, when you're bouldering, right? So this isn't like a rock climbing wall, right? You're out in nature, you're out in the wilderness climbing. Yeah, when I'm bouldering, when I'm training, right. I'm on a rock wall. Okay, mm-hmm. gotcha. Go ahead, con- continue with your training. Yeah, so I'm training, and now I'm doing, I'm actually doing a really interesting and new style of training where I'm do- adjusting my training regimen based upon my fatigue index. So I okay. attach a, da- okay, this word's really hard for me to say, a dynamometer to a force board which is just like think about like a a cylindrical piece of wood and then i attach it with a chain and i put attach it to the top of a like a squat rack right okay and then i will sit on a bench so i can reach the board and i will pull the board down as hard as i can and if you're pulling the board down as hard as you can you will lift your body up right and you'll do right. pull up right 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 but i'm trying to prevent myself from doing a pull up so i will put a uh barbell on my lap with a like kind of like a pillow in between the barbell and my lap and then i'll put about 350 pounds on the barbell 
Oh my god. More than ideally I can lift up. Uh I'm getting pretty close lifting that though. Oh my <laughs> just just in a pull. Uh and this is a full body pull. So I'm also not only am I pulling with my upper body, but I'm also engaging my core and I'm even like kicking off of my feet a little bit. So this is a max isometric pull. And then I have my force calculator. It's in kilograms. My healthy pull is 135 kilograms right now. So you can, it's like times 2.2 for pounds, which is, uh, oh God, math. <laughs> uh, it's, it's like almost 300 pounds. Okay, so you basically, yeah. and, and stop me if I'm, I'm wrong, so basically you're just training yourself to be able to throw yourself as easy as possible. Yes, as hard as I can. <laughs> yeah. And this is what I do immediately after my warm-up. And now I'm doing this to measure my fatigue, not to see what my max is. So with my max, I then take whatever I have for that day, and I take a percentage of that. So okay. if I only am pulling 120, and I want to say that my healthy climbing is 135, then I'll calculate what percentage of 120 is 135. If it's below 85%, I won't even climb because I have uh, not passed my fatigue test. I am in the fatigue zone. I need to recover and I need to not get injured. Okay. So can you explain, explain to me the difference real quick uh, between max and fatigue? Uh, yeah. So my max okay. pull helps me find my fatigue. So okay. I'm doing this max pull at the end of every warm up. So I can get a number. So you're pulling as hard as you can in other uh -huh. words. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So every time I'm pulling as hard as I can. And what that what the force calculator, the dynamometer tells me okay. is how hard I am pulling. And then I can just like I write it, I have a notebook, it says person on it, and I just do the math and then I'm like, okay, I got this percentage, which means I can train power or I can train endurance. If I got like in between eighty five and ninety, I'm probably just gonna train endurance. And not do anything crazy hard. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, so is part of this muscle fatigue, but then also cardio too? So do you do a lot of cardio? I don't do cardio. Really? No. Um, while cardio is great, it is not a really big component of bouldering. And I guess you could say that I'm kind of getting cardio when I'm arcing, but not exactly because it's it's not for long enough time. Like I think cardio right. and I think running. Stuff like that, biking. Oh, I do bike all the time. So well, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you did mention though that like when you're doing bouldering, right? It's it's a pretty short stint. It's a sprint, yeah. right? As you put mm -hmm. it. Uh, yeah. So I, I mean, you may be, you probably can't do it for an extended, extended period of time, obviously. But like, you're trying to be as effective in that short amount of time as possible, right? Definitely. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this, so this is your training. So how many times, how many times a week do you do this? What you just talked about. So I tell people that I tell people I lie to people. You lie I tell to people. them that I train two days on one day off. And that's because I don't want to tell them that I go in and I try to train almost every day. I just do my fatigue test and I let that tell me whether or not I can train. If I need more time to recover, if I can train, because right. if, you're I, not, if you're not hitting your numbers, then you yeah. need an off day is what you're saying. Yeah, I am okay. uh, crunching right now. I'm trying to get as much training in as possible to be as strong as I can in one month, which is a ridiculous jump because I've lost a lot of time this summer. I got in a biking accident. Oh, my God. And then I got sick, and then I sprained my wrist. So I lost so much training time to these like weird injuries that now I'm just like hitting the wall. And like yesterday, I tested really well on my fatigue index. And I just did like flash circuits, which is where I like just climb as hard as I can with one attempt on like every hard route. And it felt felt really good yesterday. Yeah. Well, that that's good. I'm glad it feels good. So so what's if you didn't have all these time constraints now, what would the, the normal timetable for training look like? For a, comp a competition, training rather for competitive bouldering yeah. would take I would want to train for six months prior. Six months, and you're trying to do six months with the work in one month? Oh, no. I've been training before this one month, but it has not been as consistent. Like, consistency is king, right? Right. And uh, I have not been able to be consistent 
partially due to you know grad school right uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> coaching teams working yeah. multiple jobs i only just started working just one job like before i think a month ago i quit my other job and i was just working way too much and climbing way too little and getting hurt and not having a good time and i didn't really need that so i i quit my uh my big boy job and was like oh i'm just gonna double down on climbing while i still can like yeah while, while your body still can take it <laughs> pretty much yeah. so so you you're you're training you're training you're training and then you get to competition day so you've been training on rock walls and so is is getting to the actual competition day and then so i'm assuming so the competitions are then in nature right or like somewhere no no they're they're on they're in rock walls oh they are on rock walls there are some like nature born like circuit climbing competitions where you just like climb a bunch outside okay but i'm doing the uh the open bouldering circuit competition Gotcha. Okay. So I'm assuming though, that is how did they come up with the difficulty for these, these walls on competition days? Like, is there a specific method to their madness? Like, is there any way you can prepare for what they're going to throw at you? Like, so they have route setters okay. make all the routes and they, I've also been a route setter before and I've set for competitions. What you do okay. is it's like hell week right before the week of a competition and you strip and clean all of your walls and then you set however many routes you need to set and you have to climb all of those routes but you're usually setting for like the open circuit a lot of route setters are setting above their ability to climb uh so they'll really? do these things like they'll do like ladder sends and they'll just try and make sure that every move works and then they'll be like well I think somebody can climb that. I bet you Ashima can climb that. Or Right. So yeah. you're trying to make routes that are at least humanly possible. <laughs> yeah. And it, it really helps to know who's going to your competition. Like we're having Northwest Boulder Fest at Seattle Bouldering Project in a few months now. And we're going to have to figure out, hey, who's going to come? Like is Ashima, uh, she's a one of the strongest boulders right now. She's like, like in the 16. country. In the world, holy shit! Yeah, and sixteen uh, years old. Yeah, she was this like um, monster American Japanese gal, and she crushes. Uh, yeah, if she can reach it, she can tear it. Like uh, she, she just like shreds through walls. It's crazy. Wow, uh, it's hilarious too because she's like five foot two or something. Don't quote just, me on that. And just killing it. Yeah, and everybody's like, but wouldn't it help to be tall? It doesn't. It doesn't help to be tall. Yeah, but like higher center of gravity and all that stuff. and Yeah, more momentum, right. more injuries. You have to do way more core workouts. It's, yeah, it's a nightmare. So, okay. So, so when, when we get to competition days, so say you're competing, right? So what's, what, what's the routine of that day look like? Oh, wake up early. Okay. Eat a good breakfast. Uh, sure. Go to the first session in the morning which is an open session they the style of climbing in the morning is a red point competition which means you have let's say i have like eight routes to climb in my category usually it's more than that and i want to get my top five sometimes sometimes it is like how you do on those all eight routes but usually it's like top five and then i'm going to spend the first three hours of that morning trying to get my top five hardest climbs done in as little attempts as possible. So you're still training the morning of? No, no. This is a oh. two-part competition. Oh, okay, okay. So everybody else, when even when citizens and like any level of climbing goes to compete, they compete in bouldering. They compete in this red point style competition, typically, where they come in and they, they have all these routes that are open for them and they're trying to get their five hardest climbs in as few attempts as possible. Right, before you exhaust yourself, right? Now, yeah, and and attempts matter. So attempts right. usually break ties. So I might have my top five might be the same as like three other people's top fives. If I have multiple flashes, which means I got them in my first attempt and I didn't fall, that's worth way more. Like that that's going to break the tie and that's going to bump me up. And then... For the opens category, the opens category is competing just like everybody else in the beginning, 
but then they're taking like the top four or even up to the top eight in that first morning session and you're competing again at night in isolation oh and wow that's when it gets really intense so so when you say attempts are these like getting the, the so your your top attempt is that your your best time i assume time doesn't matter time doesn't matter to to a certain point in degree time doesn't matter in the evening session time will matter and i'll talk about that later but okay. uh like i can go super slow on a climb i just don't want to fall on it it's performance it's performance yeah okay so so what are what are you getting judged on can i get to the top of the climb without taking a ground fall really and that's really. it the climbs are so hard that just getting to the top is what uh separates the top five usually wow because every time i've ever heard you talk about a competition i just assumed that it was whoever could climb this the fastest that's speed climbing uh and okay. i don't condone speed climbing i'm kidding speed climbing is fun uh <laughs> <laughs> it's not for me <laughs> i'm training kids in it <laughs> I do condone speed climbing. Oh my god! <laughs> I was like, "Oh no, that sounds really good." Just never mind. I actually do condone it. I'm like, "Okay." Uh, so, okay, so you 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 make your attempts, and then so so what what's going through your head mid climb? So you start the climb. What do they do? Is it, it's like a clap or a bell or something, and then you're off to the races climbing. So in that morning session, it's like pretty relaxed. Okay. Um depending on the like scale of the competition like northwest boulder fest the one we have at seattle bouldering project is pretty intense there's going to be like camera crews around and stuff Holy shit, okay because it's the biggest one in the state of washington wow. it's this probably either the biggest or the second biggest is this on tv uh it's live streamed mm -hmm. oh wow yeah and uh last year i did not make it past the morning session which i was like I had two sprained wrists during that competition. Oh my so God. Uh, I actually ended up working the live stream later on that night. And that's probably what's going to be happening this year. I'm probably going, hopefully I'm going to MC it if, if uh, I don't make it into the finals, which is very likely at this point. Uh, okay. But yeah, I think I lost track of the question. Yeah. So just, I want to, I want to know your, your mental state, like what's going through your head when you're just about to actually start, the deed of climbing right so yeah. like what's going through your head before and then right when you start so in the morning session i am looking at the route and i am doing what we call route reading i'm trying to figure out what is the best way for me to climb this route so i don't fall and i save as much energy as possible so you're looking at this wall kind of like connecting the dots in your head yeah. like where it am is. i gonna where are my feet and my hands gonna land here 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 and here it's exactly that it's a puzzle okay uh -huh. And then I have to perform on it. Now I am, uh, I'm going to brag. I am I go very it. good at flashing routes, getting routes in my first attempt. My flash grade is super similar to my project grade. Now flash grade is what you can get on your first try. Project grade is what you can get on unlimited tries. On unlimited tries. Yeah. Usually people have a huge differential in between what they can get on their first try and what they can get on their uh like 80th try because you have 80 attempts on right you're route. working you're working yeah. on the same wall eventually you're going to get that you know you're going to get find the way to put that puzzle together people have a joke when i climb if i can't get it on my first try i usually can't get it <laughs> really uh <laughs> and i do pride myself on that to a fault it is both a fault in that i don't have a good project attitude which i will uh recognize i usually just like to climb but it's also uh reflective of my ability to read routes so i am very uh heavily focused on visualization so when i see a climb i will climb the climb in my head and i will give it two or three attempts in my mind before i even get on it and these aren't just like imagining myself climbing the route I'll go through the motions. I will flex each muscle that I see that I have to use and I will try and simulate it. So I establish the muscle memory. So when I just get on that start on the very first move, I've already pulled that first move and I've already pulled the second move. Wow. That's crazy. That's like some stuff you would see out of like, I don't know, an anime or something. <laughs> it's, it's real. Visualization yeah. is, Oh geez. There is this, um, 
great study done. Now I'll I'll find it and you can put it in your notes in your podcast notes or whatnot. Okay. Uh, but it's pretty much the two groups of people. The first group, they're both solving a puzzle. The first group gets to solve the puzzle and they get time with the puzzle, like figuring out with their hands how they're going to solve this puzzle. The second group has to stand away from the puzzle and has to visualize solving the puzzle. Now, I think they both get like 10 minutes to play with the puzzle and visualize the puzzle and then they reset the clock and then they have to solve it. The group that was doing the visualization actually solved the puzzle faster. I mean, that doesn't surprise me, but that's still really cool to know that there's data data to back that. Yeah. It's wow. Visualization. Damn. Really awesome. So when when you go to start your climb, when you're the one who's up next to do the climb, uh, is do they give you time to do all that or do you like or or is it like hey come on buddy you gotta go in the morning session we have three hours to get all of our climbs when i'm on the climb i can take as much time as i want to so i'm not gonna because i'm bouldering which is a power activity i don't want to stay on a hold for more than five seconds usually so i'm going pretty fast unless it's what we call a resting position and I can like find a heel hook, which is where I put my heel usually by my head and hang it on the hold where my hands are in level so I can offload all my weight into my hamstring and uh, depump my hands. Uh, pump is where you have excess lactic acid buildup in your arms and you're trying to get more blood circulation to get rid of the pump so you can climb. Oh, so it, it's literally the pump like like you would get when you work out, when you yep. lift. It's the pump. Yeah. Okay. Like like Arnold Schwarzenegger would talk about. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right. Uh, so so you have three hours to do your climb. So how many people are usually in these competitions? Oh, too many. Too many are in the, the, the so morning session. Everyone, everyone has three hours? Yeah. that's They give you a lot of time because you're resting a lot and you're watching other people climb. And most people aren't there for the opens. Most people are there for like having a good time. And I love that. I, I like, I've done a lot of competitions like that. Uh, most, most of the times I compete, I am like that. I'm like, I'm just here to have fun. But, uh, if I'm trying to make it to the evening session or make it to the finals, I'm not there for fun. I'm just like, you're, you're, you're I'm there trying to, to go in and out as fast as possible. Gotcha. In and out to get your shit done, yeah. like have a good showing. Yeah. So is there only, one wall that everyone's climbing on is there multiple multiple tons and tons usually it's the whole gym gets reset so really i don't know if you've been to seattle bouldering project I, no you should go it's gigantic okay. it sounds like i should you're, you're you're really selling me on it yes i work there uh, <laughs> uh so, yeah so they set the whole gym up so at walls SPP, it's just the upstairs section, which is just the upstairs section. As Seattle Bouldering Project is the biggest bouldering gym in the United States. How big are we talking here? Oh my gosh. Yeah, I guess I should compare it to yeah. something that other people can. Let's see. Uh, are we talking like <sighs> like a warehouse, like bigger than like, are we talking like a Walmart sized building? Are we talking not not Ooh, quite maybe that big? Not as big as your average, maybe as big as your average Walmart because it's two serious it's two floors. Yeah, it's uh, it's. Do you work in an IKEA? <laughs> oh my gosh! There's if I'm in where the kids train and I have to go to my staff box, I will like run through the gym, which we're not allowed to do. We're not supposed to do because it's like hazardous and there are blind corners. But I will run to get to my box and like grab whatever gear I need. And it will take me like five minutes to get there and back. Oh my god, <laughs> it's pretty funny. That's wow. That's <laughs> yeah. that's really huge. So do you like you? You probably need a map of the place to get through it. We do have maps. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's like, I see people who work our front desk when they when new people come in, they'll like explain how to get around the gym, and it's pretty funny. It's like, oh, and there's a bar downstairs. If you just like keep going north, like we. Everybody uses like cardinal directions to navigate the gym. We have like names for walls based upon like what ways they're facing. Yeah, you can find uh, the, the climbing walls over there. We have the bar downstairs. We have the food court over there, and also the movie theaters upstairs. Oh my gosh, <laughs> we do need a movie theater. We do have conference rooms though. 
<laughs> really? Yeah. Uh huh. Like private reservable conference rooms. You have like a, a mezzanine, a balcony. It's like this is the place to climb. It just sounds like a cool place to hang out in general. It is. It's. I'm. I'm really lucky to have this facility that professional climbers travel to to train at. Like just last night, Alex Honnold was there. I don't know if you know who Alex I, Honnold I, is. I, I don't. Full disclosure. He's the guy. Uh, He's the guy in climbing? You may have seen this movie called Free Solo or heard of it. Maybe. He is uh, the just, ooh, what, what can I say about Alex Honnold? Is, that, he, is he like the uh, Eddie Van Halen of rock climbing? So Alex Honnold is most known for his free solo climbing. So he climbs big wall climbs that can take like 12 hours to do without any gear or any protection. So if he falls, he there's no way to get around this. He will die. Wow. And yeah. how old is this man? Oh, God. I don't know how old and he, he is. He, he's 22. No, uh, no, no. He's <laughs> he's probably in his uh, late 30s. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. He's uh he's not a boulder, so uh he just he's an endurance athlete for sure. And he's a really talented climber. So what what's the big difference between what, what he does free solo as you put it, right? Mm-hmm. And bouldering. Uh free soloing is bouldering times twelve hours. What? <laughs> so he's just climbing boulders like Never ending boulders with no protection. Uh, I'm climbing a boulder. My protection is the ground where I put crash pads under me if I, that I like try to fall on if I think I'm going to fall. doesn't always work out like that, but hopefully you have somebody also spotting you, like directing your fall into the pad. Uh, if Alex Honnold falls, he dies. That's how high he gets. That's how high. He's, he's climbing El Cap. Wow. Yeah. So, what, so... Has, I mean, does this guy, has he broken several bones? Like, is this dude just, like, really fucked himself up or what? Like, <laughs> You know, um, climbing, what we call sport climbing, which is where you're usually climbing with a rope. You're not free soloing, and you're climbing, like, a big route. Sometimes we call it multi-pitch if you have to, like, set up multiple ropes to climb it. It's actually less dangerous than bouldering because it's not sprinting. It's not high impact. It is a bunch of really... Not really, but it's a bunch of easier movements that typically most people who are sport climbing and they're sport climbing really hard. I would say like if you're a serious sport climber, once you're climbing 512, that's just climbing like V4s. And V4 is one third of what you need to climb professionally in bouldering. V4 is one third. Okay. So what, so what, how much is that? Like how, how high is that? Um, oh, it, this is the difficulty of the movement. Oh, okay. So, so like where they're placed. So yeah, I, I keep bringing myself like in my head to height, but it sounds like height really isn't that big of a factor. Yeah. Here. It's more like how, it's how, how, hard the route yeah, how, yeah, how the, the grips are placed and stuff like that. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, so one third. So what's, so one third of what? Of the difficulty of the movements. Okay. So, so what, what's, what's an easy movement as opposed to a very difficult movement It's just spacing it's spacing it's hold type it's where your feet are it's do you have body tension on this movement it might even be like the texture of the rock that you're holding on to it could be even like how many moves up to that move have you done like that has an effect on your endurance and on the energy for your next movement so we do have to take that into account but typically it is uh the movement in bouldering it is literally this is like kind of ambiguous but how hard a route is is literally the movement there are movements where you have to you, you're grabbing a pretty good hold with your hands and then you have to fling your feet up above your head and oh my god put both your toes in a crack a crevasse that's very small and you will jam and wiggle your toes in until you can hang from your toes and then you'll start climbing up your feet like sometimes grabbing your calves, sometimes grabbing little features of the rock just to pull yourself out of these movements. And then you'll be contorting your body to get out of these toe hooks 
to the point where flexibility is huge because you will be it bending like your it. legs in half. Because that sounds like I am tearing all of the muscles in every part of my body yeah, <laughs> when I think about myself doing that. And that <laughs> movement that I described is so common in uh, really hard bouldering that we have a name for it. It's called the bat hang. It's called the what? The, the bat, bat hang. The bat hang. And we like whenever you have a name for a movement, it means you're doing it a lot. So we have the bat hang and we have another really complicated movement is called the knee bar, which do you, do you think you can deduce what that is? A knee bar, dude. Uh, God, I don't even know. Like, are you just, are you using your knee to like get, get onto the next grip or something like that? So you are wedging your knee. So you find a toe, like a, a place to put your toe. And then you drive your knee into the wall and you're wedging your knee into the wall. Ideally, there's a place that can like provide some sort of opposition between your toe and your knee. So you get your leg effectively stuck in the wall so that you can what we call a cut, but you're cutting your hands, which means removing your hands from the wall and hanging off of this knee bar, which is just the, a body jam. Damn. So so you're basically finding a divot in the wall so you completely support yourself with your legs only. You can remove your hands so you can get to the next. Wow. You want to see a really cool knee bar uh, on YouTube? Adam Andra climbs the hardest sport climb in the world called Silence. And there are some absolutely insane knee bars in that climb. Uh, I'll, I'll put a youtube link in your comment description yeah as well. yeah you need to make sure you send me this stuff because this is yeah. insane this is like i it's it's so crazy that it's like i can barely even imagine how how this works in, in my head i think i would have to see it to believe it you know that sort of thing i so so this is crazy so like you you spend your three hours climbing and you're doing this and so like how how do you usually feel after the morning session like are you I mean, you're probably pretty or pretty exhausted already. Um, ideally, I've saved a lot of energy okay. in my morning session, and I've only like climbed a few times just to get my top five. And I, ideally, that is enough to get me to the evening session, where I've only been to these evening sessions twice. I've only gotten to the finals twice because so it's that competitive. It's very competitive. Wow. And I am not super strong. <laughs> uh. Well, um, then in the evening sessions, I check in to isolation where it's usually like a, a cornered off part of the gym where they'll put up all these like blinds and stuff so I can't see out of them. They'll take away my phone. They'll take away any like technology I have on me. And there will usually be like some space for me to use some workout equipment to warm up. And if they're a nice gym they'll also provide me water and snacks which is really great so thank you for that <laughs> <laughs> and then uh one by one we will get called out to go to the finals to do our climbs and usually we'll have it's actually changed a few times i think so wait, you're just like kind of waiting around to hear if you made it or not oh for the for the whole day i'm waiting around to hear if i i made it. i'm waiting for the results Okay. Right. So that and that's what takes a lot of the time. That takes a lot of the time, and they they want to push all the other like citizens through the comps. Usually, they have to like, the competition is running all day in different categories. The opens category goes earliest in the morning, so we have more time to recover before finals. That makes sense. Okay, and and so, but so after you finish your climbs, and I know we're kind of going in a broken timeline here, but after you finish your climbs, so how how are they how are they judging you exactly? Like what's so you 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 said you've been a judge before for these competitions. Oh, well, <laughs> he turned around and he showed me the back of his shirt that says "judge" on it. Uh, so what 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 are you looking for? So when I am when I don't make podium, I'm wearing a USA Climbing Judge shirt that is an official shirt, and I am judging people. I'm just making sure that they don't have false starts, which means we require you to establish on a start so you have to like kick off the wall or cut you have to come off the ground and show control and then you can start climbing that's probably the biggest thing i'm looking for right away and then i'm making sure that oh god hopefully this stuff doesn't happen but like holds don't spin they don't break this oh, has happened before shit. but yeah, i didn't even think about that yeah uh and then i'm making sure like they don't 
communicate to other participants, which is a hard one. And oh, well, yeah, because that, I mean, it's cheating effectively, yeah. right? So, yeah. And then I'm also making sure that they finish the route with control. So you have to, you go to the finish hold, which is the, the last hold in the route is usually taped. It's marked and it's very dramatic. So usually it's a pretty good hold and they move to it with one hand. We require a match. So they have to put both hands on the finish hold and they have to control that for three seconds. Sometimes the hardest part of a climb is the finish and setters will do this because they hate me. And no, <laughs> setters will do this and they'll put like a tiny, tiny hold. Sometimes it won't have any grip. Sometimes it'll be like a flat pancake that can't be held and they'll call that the mat, the finish. And you'll have to match on it usually by balancing on a hold with your feet and just like daintily pressing both hands to touch it. Sometimes the hold is so small, you can only get two fingers on it. Oh my God. And you'll match with two fingers and then you'll have to show control. Like usually you're balancing up there for three seconds and then you can hop down and everybody claps. Damn, dude. Damn. So, okay. So you're, so you're judging for all this stuff. So how do you, how do you know who looks generally better? Cause I feel like, especially where you're at, like a lot of these people are competing at such a level, right? Where it becomes hard to discern, you know, who, who is doing better than who. So like, so like what, what is usually the difference between first and second place? How many attempts they took. Okay. Yeah. It, sometimes, uh, well, there will be events like Northwest Boulder Fest. One year we had somebody come in who was just like so much stronger than everybody else. Like, Ashima. When Ashima came in, she was literally the best. And she was the only one to complete all but one of the routes. The second place only completed two of the four routes, and Ashima completed three. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, so, so it, it's, it can be that big of a difference. Yeah, that w- that's a really stark difference. Usually it's in attempts like, hey, this person flashed it. This person got it on their first try. The other person got it on their second or third try. And sometimes it does come down to one attempt. Right. So if if it's like a matter of judging, like they both got it in the same amount of attempts. Uh, so like, what do you judge on then? So they got the same amount of routes and the same amount of attempts. Right. Now we go into super finals. So there's usually there's a, a tiebreaker. There's a tiebreaker. Okay. There's a super secret route and there will usually be an intermission and everybody will like hang out for a second. The setters will start panicking because I've been there too as a route setter when I had to make a super finals route. And in all honesty, usually the setters aren't super prepared for that. So (laughs) I'll run to a route. Usually I'll take like, if I'm doing a super finals for the men's category, I'll run to a woman's route and I'll just amp it up or I won't change anything. I'll be like, no, I I won't do that because I I do need to change it for the spectators. Uh, (laughs) So I'll, I'll, we'll like put a hold on we'll take a hold away and then we'll be like, okay, we're ready for the super finals. And hopefully they don't tie that one because then we have to go do the super, super finals. What's the difference there? Same process? Or? Same process. Oh, okay. Just another route. And uh, they're going to yeah. be like, it's the same route. But then there's like spice to the bottom. So I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I've been to a competition where the setters didn't prepare for a super finals for the female category. And there's like a three-way tie so they just went to the men's routes oh my and they did like the third hardest men's routes and it was actually it ended up working but that is not good protocol that actually that looks really bad for for a route setter to have to do that like oh we're just gonna put you on the men's routes because not only like does that show that you are segregating these routes based on sex which uh in climbing, there, there are reasons to have segregated routes based on sex because, like, dimorphism, the difference in uh, body size. Like, if I have right. a bigger hand, I can get more surface area on a sloping hold, which will give me more friction, right? That's an, that's an advantage. Right. Well, I mean, if, if you know, the, the average guy on the, the men's competing are, like, they're the height rather is like six feet and then the average height for women that are in this competition is like five six or whatever then yeah you can't just make them all the same routes mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and it's important to note that it goes both ways. There are routes that I cannot climb because I am too big and I will not fit in that small box. Really? Or there are routes that have like, oh, there's another, I'm going to reference another climbing video. Um, La Rambla, uh, Margot Hayes, who actually came and coached with us at SBP for a few days. She is the first woman to climb 515, which is an insanely hard sport climb grade. So it's like, it's tall walls. And in La Rambla, she throws her foot up above her head, brings her toe down, arcs her knee above her toe, does the splits with her other leg, and hits a toe like on the other side of her body, and then downturns her knee. So it it looks almost like, oh, it I can't even describe it. You're going to have to like watch this video. Is, is this woman a contortionist? Yeah. <laughs> pretty much so she's able to like hit these feet that are so far apart from each other but also at a crazy height and then she's able to use them which like even if i was able to be flexible enough to hit those feet i might not be able to have the the active strength what we call like the mobility to use those feet because flexibility is one thing but an ability to move from a flexible position is a whole nother game. Wow. That, that is insane. So they're like, gosh. So, so when you're, are you're mid climb like that, right? What? Are, it, so it sounds like these toe stretches and things like that. People doing the splits. It sounds like more than likely. These are some of the most difficult ones, right? Would that be fair to say? Is that a fair statement? Yeah, I mean, it depends on your climbing style. Uh, I'm okay. a pretty flexible climber. I have a tendency to heel hook at my shoulder level, and I, I love that move. That's my signature move. Uh, for me, the hardest style of climbing is going to be when you put me on something that is like strict strength test, and I have to like pinch. So I like make your hands into crab claws, and pinch the air and pretend to be a crab and now do that on imaginary holds and try to climb up a wall. That is so hard for me. I just don't have that thumb strength that a lot of climbers train. And I don't think I a don't. lot of people do, dude. Yeah. <laughs> You're just sitting there with one of those, those grip things. That's all you do. Is that, is that what it is? I do that like... in class sometimes. I don't know if you've seen me. Oh, really? <laughs> those, like... I have like, I have these like rubber bands and stuff and I'm working oh, out wow. my fingers in class and then I'll do like tendon stretches I try to do it pretty discreetly, but you could probably use one of those ones that uh, the guitar players use to like strengthen their chord fingers. Yeah, uh huh. That's that's actually we use a lot of the same tools as as this. Yeah, that wouldn't that doesn't surprise me. That's that's so crazy. So um, so like the 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 fall rate and stuff for that sort of thing. So like, it when you're about to make a climb and you look at a route, is there any part where you're just like, okay, the way this this is set up, I'm I'm screwed. Yeah, <laughs> I try not to be that negative when I'm climbing. It sure, is hard, of course. though, because uh, I will see a movement, and I'll be like, dang, that is out of my style and above my level. And if I am saying that, I'm already kind of losing because I'm all about the visualization. If I can't visualize myself sure. having success in my head, how am I supposed to have success in my body? Right. It's it's a confidence thing, a lot of it, right? It's a mental game. Yeah, it, to the point where, like, oh, I I am not a super, mm, what's what's the good way to say this? Uh, and I'm not a super, like, machismo person with, like, swagger. But when I'm, like, going into competition, I have to, like, fake it. I have to trick myself. Fake I have it to be like, it. I yep. am the best. I'm going to, and I curse a lot in my head. <laughs> and, and I don't know if you're okay with that, so I won't. But I just like start spewing cuss words, and I'm just this is all in my head. I, I don't do this around children and whatnot. And but I just try to psych myself up. Yeah, of course. And be like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna mess this climb up. I'm gonna take its lunch money. I'm yeah. gonna bully this climb. It's gonna need <laughs> therapy when I'm done with it. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, on and honestly, it it works. That I mean, I do the same thing when when I'm about to do, you know, when I used to play in a band and stuff like that, I would tell myself similar things. When I used to play football, I would tell, tell myself similar things, right? It's just 
really telling yourself that you were going to fucking kill it. And it's that whole idea that the way I put it anyway, if you shoot for the sky, you at least get pretty high. You know what I'm saying? Higher than you would it if you were like, nah, I can't do this. You know, so you'll at least do better than you think you would. Yeah, there's the the flip side about that, too, is sometimes that can get your heart rate pretty high. And oh, that's we're true. always fighting our heart rate when we're climbing. Right. You kind of bork yourself from level. the start. Yeah. Because uh, you're if your heart rate is too high, you're going to be climbing inefficiently. You're going to be over gripping. You're going to be sweating. We want to be like we want to have that that psyche. But we also want to remember like to stay calm simultaneously. Calm centered. Yeah. yeah. And be as lazy as possible. Yeah. Like a, the best climber is a lazy climber. They can link every movement as efficiently as possible, channeling momentum from one movement into the other. Gotcha. So, yeah, it, it's one of those things where you don't want to hype yourself up too much. You get the adrenaline flowing because then you'll overexert yourself and kind of expend all your energy in the first go. Yeah. And what actually really sucks is at these like public events, they'll play electronic music and they'll play like hype music. And, you know, music is the oldest drug of humanity our heart (laughs) rate wants to adapt to the beat of the music and we'll like hear this pretty high bpm and it will mess you up so like in isolation before my climb i'm listening to depression just (laughs) Just like slow chill cave daughter just whatever i can to like calm myself down I really like listening to Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds before competition because he also has like a swagger about him that builds confidence while staying calm and depressed. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. Yeah, I, you know, I was definitely the opposite when I would do like any sort of a lot of physical activity. I would need something like, I mean, obviously it's not like rock climbing where I'm just like kind of exerting myself out of the gate, but um. I, I would listen to like I, I like really really heavy brutal angry music that that's what would I would listen to not really so much electronic it would just be you know I'm gonna break your face in and shit like that you know <laughs> you know <laughs> like just like you know stuff that would make you want to like kill your cat or something I don't know just stuff that's really brutal and heavy I love it yeah and I, yeah. I want that like I want those heavy vibes but yeah. I don't want like the the really intense and fast pacing of like metal music i, I love listening to metal but right. it's before a competition it's well there's slower fast. metal out there too you can make ha- metal yeah, there, yeah there's slow and heavy i mean there's metal for anything and everything out there um but i digress yeah so it's just like listening to music is, is certainly like the best therapy i think when it comes to physical activity in any sense you know because it's just it can help you so much mentally I, and so Okay, so you get through morning competition and then you're moving on to afternoon. So what's what's downtime between the between the two? I don't like to think about climbing when I'm in between the two. Uh, yeah. I I want to eat right away. I okay. want to eat lots of sugar. Um, lots of carbs. Yeah, lots okay. of carbs. Maybe maybe not too much food. Sure. Because sure. I also want to be kind of light for the for the rest of the day. Right. You don't want to weigh coffee. yourself down. You don't want to make yourself groggy. You know. So you're not going to go out and eat. A fried chicken sandwich with fries, probably. Yeah. And then I will like start my warm up an hour and a half before the comp, and I'll start. I'll do like some myofascia release, which is where I take like a lacrosse ball or a tennis ball, and I break down the sheaths around my muscles. So, so you're like rolling it. You're rolling. Okay, yeah. gotcha. And there's been some research that doing myofascial release in short spurts can increase your body awareness in your proprioception. Here's a word of the day. Proprioception. That means uh, being able to know where your body is in space, regardless of whether you're seeing your body. Ah, something that people at work will tell you that I don't have. (laughs) Yeah. Proprioception. You can train proprioception anytime you do basic tasks. Just close your eyes. Boom. And you will become so much better at moving your body if you just close your eyes and do basic things and i encourage that like if if you find yourself like feeling kind of clumsy like pretty regularly just try closing your eyes every now and then <laughs> no doubt people are going to be running into walls listening to this in and- safe spaces <laughs> <laughs> baby proof your house people uh- <laughs> 
Uh, okay, so um, so we get up to just about comp, you know, afternoon competition time, evening competition. Um, and so are you? You so you said you start warming up an hour and a half ahead of time, right? So what's that like? So you roll? Is that when you're rolling and stuff like that? I'm rolling and I'm doing a lot of spinal mobility, so uh, hip circles, torso circles, gotcha. neck movements, also. For the sake of increasing my proprioception, uh, I will do a on-the-wall warm-up where I will climb really easy stuff, Mm -hmm. get blood moving, not that much, not enough to get pumped, and then I'll do one or two, maybe even three really, really hard routes where I will like maximum effort just to get like, okay, this is what my max feels like, and I need to be stronger than this so you're 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 climbing as part of your warm-up i am okay towards the end wow wow i mean i feel like that could that could screw you though sometimes right um it could uh i try you know it's really important to hit a max before you go in though uh i try to like that's what i'm doing with my isometric poles for my fatigue testing so it's it's also a part of the habit and the habit really helps. And once I pulled my max, I will hang out for like 10 minutes and I'll uh, listen to Bill Callahan's Riding for the Feeling. Oh, it's got to be that song. It's got to be that song because that is that's the hype song without any of the hype. Gotcha. Okay, yeah. that's that's good to know that you have a th- that's kind of like your Pavlovian thing, right? You know you're about to hit competition climb, so you got to listen to that song. Yeah, and you in that headspace. It's funny you say that because I actually started using that song for when I need like motivation to do homework too. Because it, it just tricks me into like going hard. Huh? That's that's so cool. I I you know it's funny because uh, when you really think about it, Pavlovian effects take place in your day way more than you think they do, but they they happen. They're there. And so okay, so you're getting ready to to hit the wall here, and so you listen to your song. And so you're about to start. So how long do you get another three hours for this? No. For the afternoon ones? Okay. Now we get like, now we're pulled out for our four climbs one at a time. And then you'll hear your name and then you'll like try not to look around because there are way too many people. And then you'll <laughs> walk up to your climb and you'll climb your climb for, and you have like three minutes and you get like unlimited attempts in those three minutes, but you usually don't want to waste attempts because you'll do poorly. So wait, you only get three minutes three this minutes. time? Holy shit. That's, three... that's a lot of time. Really? Okay. Yeah. So how, yeah, how long, I some, didn't even ask, how long does the comps, average climb take? So I haven't done like a, a, I haven't gotten into the finals on a really big competition. So these are more like local comps where you can be the local hero. Uh, and they do have a lot of variants. Usually they're working around like their own time management of the gym. Like I did one in Bellingham where I made it to their finals. And uh, of course there like happened to be like a a local professional climber there who roasted me. And then a 17 year old kid who also roasted me. But uh, yeah, we, we only have a little bit of time. And during that comp, our isolation was like this like curtained off area for climbing and it and it wasn't as great as some of the other venues <laughs> no wait i take that back i really like vital which is the gym in bellingham it was great they have a great community <laughs> i gotta save your ass there uh so yeah but like uh, so on to get back to the question so on average like how long does a, a, a climb usually take you uh their climbs took me like a minute like a minute yeah i don't there's one they have particularly slabby walls, which aren't very overhung. So it was more of like gymnastic party trick style of movements. I remember like one of the climbs, you go through the start and then you like stand on this like triangular hold that's like really slopey and you're just like balancing on it and you're pressing your hands into the wall without any holds. And then you start like rocking back and forth and you want to jump to another volume and just kick off of it without ever contacting anything with your hands and then grab this like circular dome that you have to like compress on which you have to like hug it in midair to stabilize it was really hard that i didn't get it yeah that sounds brutal as hell so you only have three minutes to do all this 
And so, wait, do they factor in like so when you're done, do you have to climb all the way back down, and that's part of the time? No, no. When oh. I when I'm done, I'm, I'm done, and I can just jump down. Usually, they have down climb holds. If they don't, I'll be kind of sour because I have uh, some knee problems, and I don't like jumping down. So oh, they'll, they'll they, have okay. like designated down climb jugs again, what we call oh, them. Oh really? They don't mm-hmm. just like they could just like slap a ladder on it. I feel like that would be a lot easier. It's pretty much they're they're okay. like so similar to ladders at that point. They're just like the best holds. Like anybody could hold on to them. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. They're made for accessibility. Yeah, getting the fuck down. Yeah. Yeah. Um Okay, but that's not so you're usually down pretty quick. But do they, so do they don't count that as part of your time or do they? That's not part of my time. My okay. time ends when I finish the route, when I match the finish. Gotcha. So they stop it and then if you want to attempt to so attempt again or so what you said So if, if I finish the route, finish, I won't attempt you again. You don't have to attempt if again. If I fall, right. I can attempt it again, but I may may just save my skin and be then like be like, "Okay, I'm probably not going to get this route. I will have a better shot at the next 3 if I don't go again." When it comes down to that fourth and final route, I use all three minutes. So, you, so as many times as possible. In the finals in the afternoon, you have there's four routes you got to do. Yeah, typically. Okay. It changes. These are local comps, so there's okay. a lot of variants, but typically it's four. Four, and you get three minutes for each of them. Also, typically it changes with. Oh variants. boy. Mm-hmm. Okay, so they kind of do it based on the difficulty and blah 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 blah. Oh no no no! On they keep it all standard, but okay. in the local comps like that I've been to, there's been like. Oh hey, it's already ten o'clock at night, and uh, we need to push people through, so our transition times are gonna get cut, and like it's not a big deal. It's they're doing their best. So, gotcha. Okay, so, all right, so four routes, man. So by the, by the end of all this, if you make it all the way through, so is there like a prize or anything like that? Like what's so what 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 are you what are you competing for exactly? Usually there's cash purse. Really? Uh-huh. Uh, in the local climbs, the local competitions that I've done, I've only done one where there is a cash purse and I've gotten to finals, and the other one, there were, there were like, prizes, and it was, like, a very themed comp. It was a dino comp, which means, um, like, all the movements are full-body jumps, which I really like. Whoa. Yeah. It's very gymnastic. It's, it's entirely dependent on, like, how powerful can you – squat and throw yourself yeah i'd be dead (laughs) it's super fun that was actually uh the most successful comp for myself i got second in that one and i was like the only time i've made it to top three damn so so going going kind of away from the competition stuff so just climbing itself so i i mean i see you come into class like just pretty fucking torn up dude like so what is what is like the worst you've messed yourself up doing this the most severely i've been injured is not from climbing but really? my worst climbing injury is in between i had a bowstring pulley injury in my finger which is where uh the pulleys that keep your tendons attached to your bone in your finger mm-hmm. kind of pop so Oof. imagine like a fishing pole and you had that uh the the fishing wire and it's like strung and they're and it's connected to the fishing rod through right. these like rings. The loops, yeah. So it's when the loops pop and then the the wire hangs lower. Oh no, and that happened to one of your fingers? It happened to yeah, the middle finger on my left hand. And I usually wear a ring, like a, a, a thermoclat cast ring, and I have to wear that when I'm climbing. Uh, just because it's a chronic injury, now that it's popped, it is more likely to also get hurt. And when those get hurt, you're like out for so long. Well, I, yeah, I mean, cause yeah. it's not like you're you can just rest your finger. You know what I'm saying? Like, you can't just it doesn't just chill there. <laughs> and I think that it's taken me nine months to come back from one of those injuries. Shit. So, are would it be safe to say that finger injuries are one of the most common? Finger injuries for adult open male climbers are the most common, mm-hmm. and they're even more common if you are considered a heavier or a taller climber. Uh, because, because you're putting more weight on them, putting more right? weight on your fingers, and your body's bigger. And you really just, if you're a bigger climber, then you have to be selective of when you're climbing at a high level. You have to be super selective on what 
you're going to commit to. I, I mean, I believe it. So when you're climbing, are you wearing special gloves, special shoes? I mean, I'm wearing my climbing shoes, but okay. I don't wear anything else. So, okay. No so clothing. No <laughs> naked. In, in la nude. I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah. No. We're climbing pants, which is. Just oh, like, okay. There I, is climbing pl- pants. Well, I mean, you can wear any pants you want. You can wear shorts and whatnot. I prefer to wear climbing pants that are uh, like long pants that cover all my skin so I don't get. You know, get, so I can do like knee bars more effectively. Right. And you don't tear your skin yeah. off. Yeah. So, but gloves aren't our, our usual thing. Gloves are only a thing if you are crack climbing, and that is like jamming your hands in a crack right. over and over again. That makes sense. I mean, yeah, because you're just, I mean, you could really tear yourself up that yeah. way, I feel like. Um, interesting. Interesting. So, you, basically, it's just you and, and your hands. You just need to train them so you can just grip that shit as hard as you can <laughs> and hope for the best. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and the other other. Here's a more relatable injury. Yeah. It's funny enough, it wasn't as bad as the finger injury. I fell from the top of a wall and I landed face first on the ground and I no. broke three bones in my face. No. I broke my nose, I broke my orbital, and I broke my brow bone. Yeah. And I just got back up and I tried the ride again. Oh my god! I just had no idea what had happened. I I must have been in shock, and I just like kept climbing. I was did, like, oh, that's... did you get through it? I got, I mean, no, I didn't get the route. But, uh, I noticed something was wrong. Forty eight hours later. Four. Yeah. <laughs> hours later. This is a common theme for my body. <laughs> I get hurt, and I don't realize I'm injured until like inflammation acts up. And so I'm, I'm assuming you probably had a, like a black eye and like, no, I uh, felt fine for a while. I mean, that's not true. I felt a little nauseous, which is probably from a concussion. And I'm like, Oh, I probably have a concussion. I'm going to stay up later at night and play video games. Uh, yeah. And then, like a good then I'm going to go to bed. <laughs> and then the next day I'm like, Oh, I'm not feeling so great. I'm just going to like stay home and play video games and medicate that way. And then that night, I'm like, oh my god, I think I'm gonna die. <laughs> I think I'm gonna die. Uh, what was happening? I think that there's something wrong in my brain. My brain might be bleeding. I grab my phone. I call my friend Jaeger, and I'm like, Jaeger, you have to come pick me up and take me to the hospital right now. I think I'm going to die. And I was in so much pain. I was in so much pain. And he took me to the emergency room, and I had no idea what was going on. And I was, I remember just like sitting in the ER waiting to get called upon, just like rocking back and forth and being like, what is happening? What is happening? Is my brain bleeding? Like, why aren't they taking me right now? What is happening? What can be more serious than this? Classic emergency room. Yeah. I go in, they uh, give me an MRI. They're like, okay, you broke three bones in your face. And at the time they were like, oh my gosh, we have some really bad news for you. And I'm like, oh, I'm dying. This is it. <laughs> and then when they <laughs> when they told me I just broke three bones in my face, I was so happy. I was like, oh, thank God. I thought that like, <laughs> oh, I thought my brain was bleeding. I thought I'd have brain damage, but I just broke some bones in my face. That's fine. That's great. That's that's just great. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I Dude can relate with the whole i got a baseball to the face once when i was when i was playing uh junior pony and little did i know i'd actually broken my cheekbone <laughs> it was a 70 mile an hour fastball to the face and i'm just unbeknownst to me and i had a cut on my face in the shape of a baseball lace <laughs> and then i had a black eye for like two weeks and never went to the hospital for it just kind of healed it's probably like i can still have, I'm pretty sure there's like a fragment of bone somewhere in there um, because when I push like right here, I can feel it like up underneath my eye a little bit. It doesn't hurt, but you can tell it's there. Yeah. So can relate. Breaking your face sucks. <laughs> yeah. Br- breaking your face does suck. But <laughs> that wasn't even the low. The low came later. The low came when I went home uh, that night and I got prescribed some Vicodin. Oh, and oh no! Did you get addicted? No, I am allergic to opiates. I found out. Get the fuck out! So the low is three a.m. 
vomiting with three broken bones in your face. Oh, no. So you're like straining and shit. So like your face is just like you probably feel worse than when you went in. <laughs> Once again, I thought I was going to die. <laughs> Jesus Christ. So back to the hospital you went? No. So oh. this time I knew like what what was happening. I'm like, OK, these these pills did not sit with me. Uh, I'll try them again tomorrow and we'll figure it out again it, next day i was throwing up like almost instantly i take the pills uh, i take like one or two whatever and and then i just vomit like 20 minutes later oh shit yeah. so what did so what did you do so did you have to get like different prescription or I just did advil are you fucking kidding me yeah they, they gave me <laughs> super advil like the really heavy 800 milligram just so advil. S- some strong ass ibuprofen yeah. mm-hmm, pretty much <laughs> And like that's that's not really good for your body either. No, like, ibuprofen is, is it's funny because I was listening to Rogan the other day and he was talking about like I think it was Rogan. He's talking about apparently ibuprofen is awful for you. It fucks up your stomach biome or, so, or something like that. It's fine to take every once in a while, but there was a I guess a dude he was talking about that took it every single day. And it just destroyed him. Like his like his health was in the dumps. Like dude was sick all the time and and like it was poisoning him. And so, like, as soon as he stopped taking it, he got better. Yeah, I will go to great lengths to not take Advil to the point of, like, I've been talking to my physical therapist about what anti-inflammatories I can take that aren't Advil. And, like, I have a very nice turmeric supplement now. Is that how you say that word? Turmeric. 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 People say it differently. I think that's a tomato-tomato there, isn't it? Maybe. Hopefully. Yeah. I mean, we're just going to assume so for the sake of this episode. And then there's different types of cinnamon as well that you can take. It's it's not your like regular store-bought cinnamon. It's C- expensive cinnamon. Medicated cinnamon. Well, it's not it's not like made for medication, but it's an anti-inflammatory and Interesting. you can just put it in your coffee and, or put it in your pancakes or put it in your oatmeal and like So it works like regular cinnamon. Yeah. Yeah, it's it tastes great and it's usually like better cinnamon because it's like a higher it's like a better quality I'll, I'll do um i'll look up what cinnamon i'm i'm using and we can put in your notes hell yeah dude i yeah. tons of notes here i love it <laughs> tons of notes yeah. yeah uh so damn so br- break your face tear up your fingers so no broken legs or anything like that no landing wrong or any anything um fall injuries i only have the broken face uh, wow. I have dislocated my fibula, but that was playing soccer. Oof. The most dangerous game. <laughs> the most dangerous game. I played seven years of football. Not a single injury. Uh, kind of unbelievable. Unbelievable. I mean, I have a bad ankle because of it. But that's about it. <laughs> I, kinda, I got really lucky. Have you got an EEG? An electroencephalogram? What the fuck it, is that? I know. There's your other word. I got you with proprioception, and now I'm hitting you with electroencephalogram. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that is a brain scan. Oh no, I've never had that. Measure the impact of micro concussions. Ooh, fun! I did have a buddy that did had on the flip side. He got three concussions during when we played football together. (laughs) Yeah, it's uh, I am, I played some football too, and I probably got a lot of micro concussions, and I'm probably gonna have to deal with those when I am in my late forties. It's not gonna be a fun thing when our brain starts being like oh your parents thought this was okay when it's really not a good idea yeah i think it was like after the third or fourth concussion you can't play sports anymore is the the rules in my school district anymore yeah who follows those rules though yeah i know right yeah kids think they're they think they're unstoppable and they're just gonna keep doing it because everybody else is doing it and it's just not safe and it is yeah so sad there's got to be some some sort of something to having kids doing these very physically as like exertive but also very high impact sports at such a young age when their bodies are still developing i feel like that's a really good way to set someone up for health failure later in life (laughs) Yeah, and kids have more neural plasticity when they're young, so like their brains can recover better. So I am thankful they can or cannot. They can. Okay. Mm-hmm. I am thankful that I 
when I did play football, I was pretty young, and I'm hoping that that will act in my benefit. But then I switched to lacrosse and definitely got a lot of head injuries. Oh, in yeah, lacrosse. lacrosse is brutal, man. Yeah. And the, I, I, I don't know if the pads are quite as thick as in football either. They're not. No. And you get a, a lot of micro concussions, and we're actually – the research is pointing towards the impact of micro concussions – as a bigger factor to having traumatic brain injuries really later on in life. And that is scary because these are not identifiable instances of traumatic brain injury, like a real concussion, like a real, like a uh, macro level concussion is like when you get what you think is a concussion, you know it when you get a micro concussion, you don't know it. You, you get bonked in the head. And it's not, and maybe you're dazed for like a second and then you're immediately 100%. And it's these small ones like heading a ball in soccer or like rattling your helmet back and forth really fast in lacrosse as like some sort of war chant. These are the ones that are going to bite us. Really? Yeah. I never, I never knew about that. So like, is it just because over time you get so many, they just kind of like build and build and build and build? And then, so, like, what is this, like, leading to dementia or something like that, like, later? Dementia is one thing it leads to. Yeah. It could also lead to depression. Mm. It could also lead to domestic abuse. What? Yes. There is a stark correlation with uh, brain injury and domestic abuse. Micro concussions and domestic Domestic abuse? abuse. Yeah. Maybe I should look for that study for you again geez i should write all this stuff down before (laughs) i go (laughs) maybe Uh i'll just have you i'll I'll have you text me them later and i'll I'll add them into the show notes Mm -hmm. so that that's so crazy like domestic abuse has a correlate i'm i'm definitely gonna have to read in these studies so all those injuries but then we also we got to talking about about kids a little bit and you also coach kids right yes okay so so what what is it like welcoming kids into the wonderful world of bouldering it's the best. Yeah? Yes. Oh, my gosh. I love my job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because you're first and foremost a coach, right? Uh-huh. And I get to see these kids. I've had some of these kids for two years, and I get to see them grow. And I remember, geez, I, I had this one 10-year-old kid. Okay, I don't like saying this because I don't like labeling the kids – for good labels or bad labels. So this is like not going to come back to this kid. I won't even say his name, of course. But this kid is on the track for the Olympics in 2024 in Paris for climbing. No shit. This individual. How old is this kid? Right now, he's 12. Oh, shit. Okay. And I won't even tell him this. I won't even. I, I do probably have to talk to his parents at one point in time. But I am so hesitant to say this because if if he wants to pursue this it will kill his childhood and i don't want to be the person to kill his childhood pursue kill his childhood how like just training and all that he has the potential and he has the attitude and he has the mental game to be a serious contender for the olympics in 2024 to do this, he has to stop being a child at age 12. He has to come to the gym and train six days a week. Not climbing, not having fun. Maybe three of those days are fun. The other three days are rehab, are prehab, are injury prevention, or like core training, weightlifting, uh, like training his metabolic systems. And they're just not fun. And Geez, this kid, he's he's playing ultimate frisbee right now and he's so excited about that. And Damn. he actually at a he came to one of my classes last night after doing ultimate frisbee for like six hours and he was pretty fatigued and like falling off of stuff he usually doesn't fall off of. And but I wouldn't want to tell him to not play ultimate. Right. Like how do you how do you balance that you know letting letting a kid be a kid and also but like this kid shows talent you know what i'm saying with it and it it's that weird thing where at that age does a kid really 
know what they're getting themselves into. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't, they're at that age where they don't really realize that they're dedicating themselves to something like this and they're losing out on all this other stuff until later. Right. So it's not like they can truly make an informed decision. Yeah. You're referencing like the Ericksonian stages of identity development. Yeah. And kind like of. In this, at age 12, you're figuring out, are you good at anything? And he needs right. to figure out all these things. And then the next stage is, who are you? And he's somewhere in between these two stages. And I know if we jump the gun and be like, okay, dive into climbing. Yeah, he knows what he's good at. He's really good at climbing. But sure. then he's just climbing. Right, exactly. And so you you have this conversation with the parents. It's like, yeah, your kid is really good. Now you have a the choice of, as a parent, whether you talk to your kid about this and it's like, hey, do you want to dedicate your life to this? And yeah, they may say sure. But I think I, I think it's a matter of like, okay, let's try this. Let's see how the kid takes to it, right? Let's see how they do. And if they ended up absolutely hating it, of course, take them out, right? If they don't want to be there, that's that's the thing. Is like I I mean I've seen I've seen it firsthand where like you know parents put their kids into sports they don't necessarily want to be in. They may even be good at it, but they don't want to be there. You know what I'm saying? So that's what it comes down to. They may be just doing it out of like it's their parents living vicariously through their kids or what have you. You know what I mean? I mean, I've I've seen that all too well growing up in a very big sports high school. So, yeah, I I think that's a very difficult choice to make. But I, it's worth bringing up. If the kid is truly talented, I think it's at least worth bringing up, personally. Yeah, and they love climbing. Yeah, uh, and that's I know that. exactly. And, geez, there's... um. I see a lot in this kid of what I saw in myself when I was his age. Yeah. And uh, I've been with this kid for two years. Okay. And there's like this, this quote, I don't know who said it, but like, you know, we, we say that we see the best of ourselves in the kids that we teach and the kids that we raise and the kids that we're like part of their community. But we also see the worst of ourselves in them. And I don't, I see like what relationship I have with climbing yeah, and what relationship I've had with sports as a kid. Right. And I like, I played football. I never liked football. My parents made me play football. My father made me play football. And that's something that like, I haven't exactly forgiven him for. Be and cause like I wasn't able to explore what I liked as a kid. And I hope that this kid I hope that I am right in knowing that he likes climbing. I really do. Right. I think I think it's a matter of just checking in with him and being as transparent as possible and having him being as transparent as possible too, right? Like just being honest. Like I think the most important part of that situation is opening it to where the kid feels like he can comfortably state how he feels. You know what I'm saying? Because the the minute that he feels like he's he's taxed with doing this thing just because he's good at it right like this is now a burden on him because of his talents I mean that's that's when when you, you lose out on it right I mean granted there's the whole like motivation of like if he's really good at this thing he could become an Olympian he could become sponsored he could make a lot of money blah 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 it doesn't matter at the end of the day when you're if you're not happy you know what I mean especially if I mean the kid pursues climbing and and somewhere along the way he fucks himself up you know yeah that's the other fear <laughs> yeah. about like you put so many of your apples into rock climbing and then rock climbing enters you and then you can't climb and then like how do you get that feeling again like right geez i have gotten injured time and time and time again but i just keep crawling back i keep doing these like extensive rehab programs going through so much pain and it's just to get the feeling again it's just like chasing the dragon, so to speak. Yeah. And it's back yeah. to, you know, my hype song, right. Bill Callahan's writing for the feeling. Damn. Yeah. I, I feel like if that, if someone made a biopic about Roger, that would, that song would have to be in there. I, so 
that that's so crazy but like but would you take it any other way or would you would you have it any other way i don't know it's it's hard because i only have my one experience right um you don't know what you haven't experienced yeah. right so yeah jeez i i think about like if i could change things would i right right of course well there are some obvious things that at first i'd be like oh yeah i would change not getting that fibula fibula injury when i was playing soccer but that fibula injury allowed me to go to physical therapy and uh learn a lot a lot of information that i've been able to pass on to the teams that i coach and help them not get this injury and help them not get any version of an ankle sprain so i'm i'm like thankful for that injury and i that should be the easiest thing. That should be the easiest thing to go back in time and be like, oh, yeah, of course I don't want to dislocate my fibula. Of course I don't want to break those bones in my face. Right. But, but it's all part of the learning experience. Yeah. And if I can suffer through these things to learn those lessons, I'm good at teaching. I know that. Yeah. I know that I can, I can teach these kids to not have these experiences and like show them the ways to avoid them. Yeah. And I mean, I think injury prevention is a, is a very important thing. Like I seven years of football, there is definitely points where like, I like playing football. Definitely points where I fucking hated it. Didn't want to show up. There was a whole thing with that happened my senior year with, with small town football politics and drama um, that I won't get into here, but at the end of the day, like I'm very thankful for the way my coaches approached things because I walked away with basically no major injuries my entire seven year football career, which is fucking impressive because especially during the season, all of our workouts were centered around injury prevention. So I came away really, really lucky. Um, and so in that way, I'm thankful now to, but you're, to your point, do I regret playing football? Yeah, sometimes. But I, to, to your other point, I think that the lessons that I learned, especially through that whole situation my senior year, I learned that as, as an individual, right, like I, I, I can persevere, right? Like no matter how shitty the situation gets, I can pull myself out of it like mentally, physically, right? But it also helped me become very self-aware, right? Especially now looking back, you know, hindsight 2020, blah, blah, blah. Um. Because it, it helped me realize, you know, just the sort of bad state I was actually in after it was over, right? Like, how how mentally draining all of it was. I mean, small town football, dude, like, especially in that town, it's fucking brainwash. It really is. Like, I, we were brainwashed <laughs> to a degree. You know what I mean? Like, like you know, this no, no fucking weak links, no, you know, don't be a pussy, come to show, you know, show up, you know, don't be afraid to hit people. You know, or and if you're if you're early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. Shit like that, you know. And if and it it was it was so cutthroat to the point where like if you missed one weightlifting sh- session, one practice, whatever, it was like you weren't even a part of the team anymore. You were you were part of the team, but you weren't really part of the team anymore. It was shit like that. Even if you were 100 percent committed, like a lot of us were, the moment that you even thought about like being late for practice or whatever you like the coach was looking down his nose at you. And so it, it was, it was kind of that fucked up the relationship where it's like, does this guy really care about me. You know what I'm saying? Like, does this guy actually care or are we just like cogs in the machine to win another championship for the school so they can make more money or make somebody look good? You know? Yeah. Uh, and you know I'm a, I'm a sociologist. You may not know that. Maybe. Yeah, I'm I'm a I'm but, an armchair sociologist. Yeah, same. <laughs> uh, that is, those tools that you described are actually really great for making a, a strong team. But they're tools of homo socialization. Yeah. yeah, and I and I think that's that's true too. To the but to the point where if it's negatively affecting someone mentally, I think it's going a little far. It is. It is negative. It is. It is bleeding out any individuality, any differences, yep. because if you have individuality, it could create variables, and variables don't oftentimes work in your favor. 
Right. But it's also just weak and inconsiderate leadership on the coach's part mm. to not be able to like, especially with football, which has this potential to be like such a beautiful organization of skills. Cause you have these roles that are hyper specific. There's the tight end, there's the quarterback, there's the guard. And like they're, they are individual roles and they all have their own unique jobs. It almost makes sense to like really promote individuality instead, like uh, to a, to a point, but that doesn't happen. Right. And it's like part part of me, you know, there was definitely points where, you know, during the season, you just feel like you're another silver helmet. That was that was our the color of our helmets in high school was a silver. You know, you just felt like you're another silver helmet. My favorite part of football was never the season itself. It was the off season when everyone would show up. Everyone, you know, we would hang out and we would work out. We'd work out hard as a motherfucker. That was my favorite part of it because it just felt way more lax. Right. It wasn't like, you know. You're working on goals for the season, but the season felt far away, right? Like you were just worried about, you know, being physically ready for the season, and that's all you were worried about. And at that point, you know, maybe maybe we had more of that individuality. Maybe you know we felt like people because you know we weren't hiding behind behind a helmet and a number. You know what I mean? Maybe maybe there's something to that. Um, but yeah, from a sociology pers- perspective, like coaching is such a a crazy thing. There was that uh. God, what one of one of an underrated film? That, what was that movie uh, with Steve Carell, Channing Tatum, and they were like running a wrestling team, or something oh. like that? Uh, Fox, Fox, some a Fox Catcher, Fox Catcher. Yeah, I haven't that, seen it, but I know I know the story. Dude, that movie is underrated. Such that was a such a harrowing movie. Um, so the but there was a part where Steve Carell's character has a monologues about coaching, and he's like, you know. Uh, a coach is one of the most powerful people in a person's life. And I'm like, holy shit, that is so true. So like you as a coach, I've never been really a coach personally, but you as a coach, like how does, how does things like that affect you? Like the, from your experience, like how does that affect your coaching technique? I take social modeling very seriously. Yeah. I will not do anything that I don't want the children to do anything. So, what this does mean, though, is sometimes I swear and I let the kids swear. Ooh, hopefully the parents don't find out about that. <laughs> uh, I don't let the kids swear at each other. I don't let the kids even say shut up to each other. And I won't say that stuff. I will never say like anything that tries to um, do like social homo, homo socialization. So like I won't try to control the status quo ever. And when I am social modeling this, I'll be pretty weird. I like, I promote weirdness and being okay with weirdness. And, uh, like even with the kids, I let them like mess around with each other, like wrestle and whatnot. Cause they're kids. They need to have time figuring out like what is okay behavior and how everybody has to have a different definition of okay behavior based upon like, what they feel about their own personal space like sure sure in our motto is like as long as it's consensual you're not gonna have a negative consequence like i've had these two kids go at each other like wrestle each other and they're just like playing around like figuring out like where they are in their lives potentially exploring other feelings about each other sure i don't know uh and i'll go up to them and i'll be like well is this mutually consensual? And if it's yes, then I don't care. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's, <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's, that's, that's certainly one way to put it. I, so not only that, but like, so then the actual coaching of, of kids into, into bouldering. So, so what, what is that like? And, and, you know, like, of course you have an entire spectrum, I'm sure of, of kids that truly are, want to be there they're super excited to be there they oh you know they love to climb and then you have the kids that are like maybe this is just a fleeting thing right you know maybe this is just like spur of the moment hey mom and dad i want to try rock climbing because that sounds fun and it's probably not a thing they're going to pursue in the future so how do you adapt your coaching ability to kind of cover that spectrum of of interest i guess i don't adapt (laughs) really so um my expectations 
for right. the on-site teams. We have different levels of team. Mm-hmm. On-site is the highest level of competition. I don't want to have to motivate the kids. The motivation has to come from them, and it can't come from their parents, and I know when it comes from their parents, and I will talk to their parents. Oh, it's, it's so it's I very, very clear. The team. Wow. Yeah, that's, you, this you, actually happened. Yeah, take take Junior over here. You get, you're done. Yeah, we had yeah. a girl. She was especially talented, very strong climber. Mm-hmm. Hated climbing. Hated oh it. Oh, my gosh. And uh, at one point in time, uh, the other coach and I, we, we, like, sat her down, and we talked to her and, like, okay, well, we'll get you through this month. You can do what you want to do, but you know what? You don't want to be here. We don't want to make you be here. And I really like that kid. I really like her. So it was it was a bummer, but now I see her – Semi frequently, and she climbs for fun, and it's great. Wow. And her parents, her dad, was so mad at us for not like making her do things. But that's just not the way we work. No, you can't, dude. You can't. Yeah, my expectations for the kids. I have three expectations at the beginning of the season. I'll tell them these three expectations. I want them to have autonomy. That's my first one. I want them to like own what they do and own themselves. I want them to have self-efficacy, which builds off of autonomy. I want them, everything they do is motivated by their own discipline. And I want them to have self-advocacy. I want them to tell me when they feel things. I want them to advocate for themselves, which is the most difficult part. Yeah, because I mean, some of them just, I mean, whether it's they just don't understand what's happening around them or to them or they just don't know how to talk about it they just don't know how to verbalize it yeah and i think i could do better at helping them be advocates for themselves Mm -hmm. uh i do talk about like body check-ins and like how in our warm-up i repeat the same joke over and over again where i'm like i don't know what your body is feeling how's your body feeling today and then, like, our warm-up is a body check-in. Like, we do these exercises to see how our body is feeling and whether or not we have to change things throughout the day because it's so dangerous. Climbing is so yeah, dangerous. Yeah, that's – I mean, I think that's incredibly smart, especially when you have kids that just don't know how to, you know, communicate things. And, and it's funny because it's learning and understanding your body and your mind is a constant lear- learning process. Like – even even I sometimes don't quite understand, you know, why I think the way I do or why I feel the way I do. You know, I mean, because I mean, I've, I've been I mean, quite frankly, I had a, like a bad mental health week three weeks ago. And I was like, I just couldn't for the life of me figure out. I was like, why, the, you know, why is this shit affecting me the way it does? You know what I mean? So like I had to sit down and kind of like self reflect and kind of really get down with it, you know, talk to people really, you know break it down and try to understand like and dissect why I felt the way I did. And, and that way, I mean, of course, like venting is always cathartic. Right. Um, but in that way I came away with a better understanding of like why I feel that way. And like shit, like maybe, maybe what I experienced was like a panic attack or whatever, or anxiety and things like that. But like when you're a kid, all that shit is blue ocean to you, you know? Like, whether it be physical, whether it be mental. So putting that shit into words is incredibly hard. I mean, shit, you might not even have the vocabulary. Like, shit like anxiety, shit like panic attacks might not even be in your your repertoire yet. Or or even concussions, for instance, you know? How do you know? Yeah, and to that to that thought, like, the blue ocean and not knowing how to like advocate for yourself, not knowing what you need and not knowing what these like really intense feelings are. Right. They don't. And it shows up like it, sometimes kids act out. And yeah. When they, they act out, you have to figure out why mm-hmm. sometimes they don't act out. And Oh God. Oh, we had the toughest week. Yeah. The toughest week on team where, in two days, I found out that two kids were cutting. Like, cutting themselves? Yes. Really? How old are these kids? Oh, these ones, like, 
15 and 14. Okay. Too young. A- a- about that age, though. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, you know, oh, I took that so hard. I, re- I found out, like, these back-to-back days, and on the second day, I, like, ended practice half an hour early, and I had everybody sit down at the table and just, like, talk. Really? And then afterwards... We those, had, those two kids were there, them included? They, they were there. Uh-huh. Okay. We didn't talk about that. Well, of course. But we yeah. just, like, told stories. Okay. And, oh, jeez, I forget the stories that I told. But ones with like themes of supporting each other and kumbaya and whatnot, like so Seattle. It was so it was such a Seattle moment. <laughs> uh, but you know, and then I had to talk to the head of our department, and I had to the next day I had to write every interaction I had with both of those kids regarding how I found out about them cutting what I told them when they were cutting how they reacted every piece of dialogue that I could remember and I titled this out and it was like three pages and I had to like disperse this amongst like our higher ups and then we I had to uh I actually didn't I had um oh my gosh our our, the head of our coaching she had like all the teams I just had one of the teams uh, she's so great. Just, well, just a, an am, amazing person. And she supported me through that because it was really trying for myself. And she called CSS, Child, Child Protective, CPS, Child Protective Services to see if we had to like report it. And she, she really like took the ball. And I'm like so thankful for that because that was that was hard for me i think i am like so emotionally invested in these kids that like it both makes this job the best job in the world and it makes those weeks the worst weeks in the world yeah the the way the kids are feeling is the way you're feeling by extension really and i think you shouldn't beat yourself up too much about it because i think that's signs of a good coach i think that's someone who is empathetic and truly cares about what they do um and that's great because, I mean, I think you and I both have had coaches that are the opposite, <laughs> you know. I think we have both have had people, whether it be teachers or coaches or what have you, that, you know, they come into your life and they're just they're just not that invested. They don't care, you know. You're just you're just a, another another I mean, not even maybe a name to them. You're just another person that rolls through their life and leaves you know and so I think the way that you approach things is really good and I'm glad you handled the situation the way you did so did you so you did you didn't talk very candidly about this whole situation with them it was more so like or was it kind of directly yeah we we talked we, oh you did okay yeah, so you like uh-huh. very like you asked about the subject at hand with the whole cutting thing and yeah okay and Jeez, it's uh <laughs> yeah we don't have to dive reason, too deep like to talk about how, though like as much as you're comfortable i'm not gonna i'm not gonna pry i honestly which is this is funny because i i had to write everything down right but i right. honestly like i can't remember our conversations very well which yeah. is the exact opposite of like how psychologists talk about memories usually your traumatic memories stay with you maybe they weren't sure. that traumatic for me i sure. i remember after that practice we have like a a, like closet i remember going into the closet and just like turning off the lights and just like sitting down for like 10 minutes and being like by yourself by myself okay these kids why what why i was so mad i was not at the kids i was just so mad at everything yeah oh like what could possibly make you self-harm you're a kid you're supposed to be having so yeah. much fun life is supposed to be that's the best. But they're doing it because something isn't so good in their life. Yeah. And, you know, uh, that's when I probably started trolling Instagram. Trolling? Uh, yes. I, you know, I attribute, it's easy for me to blame the bad guy. It's easy for anybody to blame the bad guy. And for me, 
Instagram because is. Of, yeah, because of all this research that I've done into uh, developmental oh, psychology. Yeah, upward and downward social comparisons and stuff like that. The bad guys, yep. social media. Yep, it's part of it. It's definitely 100% a huge part of it. And my catharsis, which is also a misnomer, by the way, catharsism is not a good practice. It actually reinforces the aggression usually. Uh, but my catharsism was putting a post up on Instagram and then smack talking Instagram. Like the Instagram in itself. Oh, yeah. I would just okay. burn on social media and burn on everybody who would ever look at this post. Yeah, so that's wow. all my Instagram content. Uh, <laughs> I don't post a lot, but uh, when I do post, I'm mad. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I definitely have some, some, some qualms about social media, um, and it's such a love hate relationship for me. But so, so back to these, these two, these two girls, right? It was two girls, correct? Yeah. Okay. Um. So do you do you think that it it stemmed from like a home life thing? Like do you, I mean is the sh- shitty at home or was it like social pressure at school? You know, one of them, uh I actually coach oh, I can't say identifying information. Uh, so absolutely don't. Yeah, please I don't. I actually don't think I can get into that. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay, gotcha. All right, let then let's 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 kind of circumvent that. But like just in the grand scheme of things like as a coach, man, that's just you you i mean it's it's like being a teacher you're getting kids from all walks of life you know you'd never know what kind of home life they have what kind you know what the shit that they deal with right and and so i think that showing up to you know climbing you know and and coaching them every day i mean it's you never know what you're going to get you know it's like a life's like a box of chocolates, you know, the whole thing, you know, you just don't know what kind of energy, what kind of story that they're going to bring. And maybe that's then maybe that's part of the excitement. Right. Maybe. I mean, dealing with people. Right. It, that's that's what makes dealing with people so interesting is because, you know, you have all those variables. But at the same time, you have all those variables. Right. <laughs> and some of those are negative. And so that's just the, the nature of the beast, I guess. But I mean, it doesn't sound like you'd have it any other way. Yeah, uh yeah, it's it's part of the job having kids come in with baggage and right. uh I've had difficulties with some kids who come in with extra baggage and just like being patient. Sure. And uh trying to have them find more productive ways to work that out. Right. And 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 I'm sure some of those kids that come in for for climbing I, would would you call it class sessions practice team team mm-hmm. would they're probably using climbing as an outlet some of them anyway like it's 100 percent something to put their their energy towards and and just get the lead out some of them i'm sure yeah they, we have a, a lot of life lessons on climbing team oh uh, i'm sure <laughs> i do not doubt it uh it is it is a place that hopefully they they can feel safe and have a community and we are very open and it is really great it's uh it sometimes climbing team can also give them some very real life long lessons definitely in not in a good way yeah okay in a good way not in a good way as well though it's yeah that's the idea right like when i came in i was replacing a coach his name is jeff and then i think three months into my time on the team jeff died whoa so that's heavy and this happens pretty frequently in the climbing community well i mean I guess that it's not unbelievable, but it's, that's still fucking a wild circumstance to deal with. Yeah. Uh, and all the other coaches besides me knew Jeff and they were wrecked that week. And I can imagine it was like the kids were a wreck. That was a hard week, but Oh geez. I remember one of our uh, longer coaches. She, 
was so blunt about it and because she's like been in the community for so long this has happened to so many of her friends and you just like people die that's that's like what she said she's like people die in this industry and it, it's it's gonna affect you but you're just it's part of what we do it's what we love and it's the risk of what we do and what we love because it's you know you're riding for the feeling and you have to ride higher and higher and faster and faster ultimately leading in disaster chasing that dragon but ultimately i think it, it comes down to like you know okay there may be like you know that that inherent <laughs> that inherent risk of like really fucking yourself up or even dying but you know what like i think that it, from the sounds of it it's a choice right it's it's a choice that these people make when they get into the sport that they decide to take this risk because it's it's what they love and i think if they're going out happy right you know no regrets and they're doing what they love right i think i mean that's just it right they 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 did they died doing what they love and i mean i i highly doubt they would regret it you know yeah that, that's a lot of the sentiment that gets reflected uh, right in these conversations i mean yeah un- unfortunately for jeff's family he left a kid Ooh. and god a wife and people who loved him and he did that doing something he loved and geez you're not supposed to speak poorly of the dead so i won't but i'll speak poorly of climbers <laughs> climbing is a self centered sport it sounds that way yeah that's like that's like uh you know someone with a wife and kid like god this is not 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 hard comparison but like kind of like going off into war you know what i'm saying in in some ways obviously to a lesser degree but you know it's just you're going off to something you know into something that has a very very high risk of of you know serious consequence and you know if that's what you're passionate about it i mean nothing's probably going to stop you but like having a family is one thing it's a pretty heavy thing to consider doing something like this you know and i i watch a lot of climbing media a lot of climbing movies Mm -hmm. and like stories of people climbing like k2 or climbing these crazy mountains or these really hard climbs like and it's important to know and to just like keep reminding yourself these people aren't heroes nothing that these people are doing actually matters these people are doing it the same reason why you're doing it they're doing it for the feeling the they're thrill. doing it because they love it and it's for right. them and it's nothing better than getting to the top of a rock it's nothing it has no consequence don't hero assess them Jeez, yeah, I I completely get. It. I was like, not to take us too off uh, off track here, but I was reading a. Uh, I went down this whole rabbit hole with uh, the lo- thalassophobia. Are you aware of thalassophobia or thalassophobia? So I'm not. Thalassophobia is basically a fear of like open ocean, op- like open sea, like basically fear of the abyss. And so it led me into this whole rabbit hole about deep sea divers and deep sea cave divers. It's basically like kind of like climbing but the opposite direction in a lot of ways uh and it's that whole thing where these people just did it for the thrill did did it because they love it and there were every time they did it there was a chance that those motherfuckers were going to drown they were going to be stuck at the bottom of a water in a watery grave never come back and like i'm like damn dude i don't know if i could like if i was into doing something like that i don't know if i could have like a family and shit like that you know what i'm saying knowing that i'm doing stuff like that because at any given day done you're just done you know god it's such a scary thing to think about but you know what life's short you know you could die any given day i could walk out right now and a bus could hit me and that it's over that's it so you know what as long as you're doing what you love as long as you're doing what you care about i think that's all that matters Yeah. There's like there's one more thing I'd like to say about Jeff. Yeah. I didn't know Jeff b- 
but and I, I, he's from what I hear, he's a great guy. Everybody speaks like so well of him and so highly of him, including the kids. I don't know him though, but I know the hole he left behind, and sure, I know what it feels like to walk into a room and tell a room full of children that I've looked up to Jeff that Jeff is dead. You had to deliver the news. Yeah. And I think that part of me will always be a little resentful about that and about like seeing, like giving the information to these kids that makes them have a horrible week. And it's just like for many of them, it's their first experience with death. Sure. Oh, that's just so rough. Yeah, man. I, I couldn't imagine, honestly. I know. <laughs> God. I, how do you not have a rough week after that, man? Everyone involved. That's just, I mean, the, is there anything, anything heavier? You know? But you know what? Like, I think at the same time, like, that was kind of like a, a reality check, too. You know? A lot of these kids, like, like, maybe from that they learned like yeah this is like this thing's no joke you know the stuff that they're doing and uh i mean this that sometimes the choices that we we make you know they, they definitely can have serious consequences but like so so how do you as a coach handle that sort of thing um when that happened everybody else on the coaching staff was devastated right and you were the one that was kind of like i didn't really know know this guy so 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 a lot of them left actually a lot of the coaches yeah they 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 temporarily temporarily they just like couldn't be there and then uh geez oh my gosh i remember so it was myself and mercedes she's another coach and mercedes like stood in the corner of the room that we have them warm up in and I was like, okay, I, uh, <clears throat> I need everybody to listen up and, and hang out. And I remember one of the kids said, I bet you somebody's died. And I was like, fuck. <laughs> oh, man, dude, like, come on. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this is so bad for you now. Like, because, <laughs> like, this kid didn't know the person who had died, no. but everybody around him is going to be crying in two minutes. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, shit. Kids need to be able to make mistakes, and I guarantee you this kid will remember that mistake for the rest of his life. Oh, my God. Okay, so... so <laughs> I wonder, what, what was that kid's reaction when you, had, when you dropped the bomb? When I dropped, oh my gosh, this was horrible. Uh, <laughs> yeah. When I told everybody what had happened, some of them had already known. Uh, okay. We had sent out a message to a lot of the parents the night before when we had found oh, out. I mean, I would hope so, yeah. Yeah. And like before I could even drop the bomb, kids were crying. <laughs> Jeez. Oh God. Uh, some kids were laughing because that's like, I just laughed right there. Because that's a way to deal with stress. I mean, it's a coping mechanism. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it was weird. And this kid had some... Jeez, I hate speaking poorly about my children. I hate doing it. But he did not react to this situation. He did not... I won't get into the specifics of it, but he did not do well. And we... I had to had everybody go do their on the wall warm up go climb do whatever it was a relaxed day relaxed the climbing was relaxed right and this kid stayed behind with another kid and i'm like i uh i told him that i couldn't imagine how he made his teammates feel and it was the only time i have been so intense with the kids that like 
I saw his face and the kid next to him and they were, they didn't know Jeff. They're on the verge of tears. And I, I wasn't yelling. I don't yell at the kids. But that time I just like, I slammed the book on them. Was well, because they were laughing. Yeah. Yeah. And, ooh, one of the kids broke down crying. Just, just when I told him like how he could have made the other kids feel by like being so disrespectful during that time. Uh, the other kid, he, he's a complicated case. He's actually no longer on our team. Uh, oh, wow. It wasn't because of that, but that was definitely part of the picture. Of like a, a long string of behavioral stuff? At the end of the day, he opted to leave the team, mm. but it's hard. It's hard to, I don't know if we would have kicked him, but I'm, I'm not sure what would have happened. I can't, I can't predict and I can't make assumptions up to how he would have been on our team. But I think that, geez, this is okay. This is identifying information. Yeah, now. don't don't feel so, like you don't feel yeah. like you need to go get into the woods here. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um gosh, as as we begin winding down here, I just gosh. So this is just entire bouldering in and of itself. I mean, it's already an interesting sport, but like when you get into the very human side of it, all of it, right? It's it's infinitely more interesting. Just anything from like prepping to competition to like coaching kids. There's so much to unpack there from a, like just even a mental standpoint. And it's just a whole thing, man. It really is. I, so what, what, what would you say was like, is like from all your time spent bouldering, how, how long have you been bouldering now? Nine years. Gotcha. So what would you say if, if you could, if you could sum up, your time that you've spent bouldering in maybe like a paragraph, how would you summarize it? At first I bouldered because I found a new friend group and it was to be in their community. Mm -hmm. Then I bouldered to stay in shape and because I was pretty good at it. Mm -hmm. And then that became a career as I started route setting and as I started coaching but, geez, it goes back to, like, people are climbing. They're climbing for themselves, right? Mm-hmm. And it's been like that my entire climbing career, except right now. I am competing this season, and it's not because I want to compete. I don't. I don't want to compete. Then why? Because I'm making the kids compete. And I believe in social modeling. You're trying to be a role model. Yeah. And if I'm making them do it, I sure as hell should do it too. Wow. And on that note, I think we'll we'll start to wrap her up here. Do you want people to find you on social media and things like that? Yeah, my social media is uh, my Instagram where I burn on Instagram is at raw, raw, Roger. Uh, I can also be contacted for like coaching and whatnot just at rogercadill at gmail.com. And uh, I work with some online coaching services as well. uh, With, uh, I actually am not doing online coaching, but the coaches that I work with do a lot of this. And that's uh, Mercedes Palmer. And I will link her information as well. If people are interested in getting healthy, getting like fit and uh like doing bouldering or mobility there's a bunch of great resources out there that i'd be happy to share right on so yeah if you guys would like to follow rogers uh bouldering slash bouldering coaching journey you can follow him at those social media there uh thank you very much roger for coming in it's been a more than harrowing discussion that we've been having about everything i think we've covered a lot of bases today and it's been a super exciting talk So for Roger, my name is Colin Sparling. I've been your host. You've been great. This has been Colin Amano. Until next time. Bye. So there you have it. My conversation with Roger Cadill, all about bouldering. What did you think? Curious to hear what you guys thought of episode number one. Uh, Go ahead and hit me up on all the social medias. 
and all that stuff at Colin in Mono. You can also email me any sort of questions you have, comments, thoughts, concerns, ideas, all that stuff at Colin in Mono at gmail.com. All right, guys. Thank you so much for listening to episode number one. I'm very much looking forward to hearing what you guys think of the show. Uh, again, theme song written and composed by Life Before Us and Christian Crump. Till next Wednesday. See you then. Bye-bye.